let me introduce Lance and pray for Lance. Uh, Lance Spencer is uh, married to Courtney, two young kids, uh, been the Chick-fil-A operator here in Lee Summit uh, after a, a, a started his career at Chick-fil-A in Oklahoma. And uh, Lance and I go to church together, and I love, I love Chick-fil-A. I love their message, their ministry, and how God is using them to impact many people for the Lord. And so I cannot wait for this presentation. And afterwards, Lance will stay behind and uh, do a little Q&A. And if you've had a question for a Chick-fil-A owner, you've been dying to ask, uh, here's your guy. He knows he knows uh, the, the company inside and out. And and uh, we'll get into his discussion questions. But also, if you've got anything you want to ask Lance, it'd be a perfect time to do so. So with that being said, let me pray for Lance and uh, kick it off. Lord, thanks for this morning. A great Great day to be with the brothers, a great day, day to uh, hear from your, uh, from your man, Lance Spencer. And Lord, I pray that you will use this message, use uh, the things we're going to hear to impact our life. Lord, that we would understand servant leadership to an even deeper level as a result of what Lance will share today. So Lord, use him in a mighty way for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Lance Spencer, take it away, bud. Good morning. Nice to be with you all. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I, I want to want to kick it off with a personal thank you. Um, uh, thank you for praying for my father. Um, in February of 2020, he was given six months to live stage four pancreatic cancer. And I know this group um, was one of the many that prayed for him. And he's just doing fantastic now. Um, and um, that's about what, 20 months in and, and he's just doing great. So last month he had his 62nd birthday um, and he celebrated with a water gun fight um, with his grandsons in, in the swimming pool. And so um, he's had quite a journey, um, but uh, just I'd be remiss if I didn't say thanks for, for your prayers. Um, super thankful for that. Um, let me kick it off to introduce myself a little bit. Um, I grew up in Independence um, and growing up, I played baseball, basketball and football and uh, got to the point where I was too short, slow and white to be good at any of them. Um, so picked up, quit all those and, and picked up golf and uh, through high school did a, a golf and choir and debate. Um, and right before high school, we moved to Liberty um, and I met um, my high school sweetheart, my wife, Courtney, at a ministry event um, that was with Young Life. And we were at a meeting and I was Mr. Business and she came here to be the life of the party. And um, I, I really thought that was pretty neat. So. My interaction with Chick-fil-A started when a friend from church gave my mom Truett Cathy's book, um, that book, um, or one of his books, that book's called Eat More Chicken, Inspire More People. And I read it and I loved it. Um, I loved this um, more than anything. I love the corporate purpose. And so um, I've got a replica here of the corporate purpose. And this actually sits outside of the um, corporate office in Atlanta. Um, uh, a much larger version, but um, you know, ultimately, this is this is why I, I, I chose to pursue this career, and um, certainly, I'd say it's what a lot of our team members identify with. And so, our corporate purpose um, is to glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that's entrusted to us, and to have a positive influence on all who come into contact with Chick Fil A. Mm. And so I'm here at the office, and not only do we have that sitting on my, my desk, but we've got it hanging on the wall in a real prominent position. Um, and uh, overall, those first three words are what motivate us to do what we do, um, to glorify God. And so um, that's what we're going to dig in and, and talk through today. So I graduated from college and uh, worked as a, a team member in Nashville. Um, my uh, girlfriend, then fiance, Courtney at the time was, was finishing college at Vanderbilt. And so I, I moved there to pursue her and worked as a team member for two years. Um, I then got into a development program with Chick-fil-A where I traveled for 18 months, lived on the road as a temporary manager, and um, eventually got selected to be the owner operator of Chick-fil-A and Sooner Mall in Norman, Oklahoma in July of 2014. Um, there's all sorts of stories about the interim manager program and about that first opportunity. Um, but in March of 2017, God opened the door for us to relocate back to Kansas City 
since Courtney and I are high school sweethearts, her family's here and my family's here. And so we just had this dream of raising a family in Kansas City and God opened that door in March 2017, where we were able to transition as, as owner operators here in Lee Summit. Um, and so now we live, work, and attend church in Lee Summit. Um, we have a four-year-old Harrison and um, almost four-year-old and almost two-year-old Lainey. Um, so they are a ton of fun and a ton of work. But um, um, yeah, that's that's really the, the, the overview of my biography. Um, and uh, so happy to be with you guys today. Um, so servant leadership. Um, why does it matter? Um, that's um, certainly any, you know, kind of business lens to a, to a Bible study. Start with, start with why. Um, one of the most popular TED Talks is Simon Sinek, and, and that's the premise of his TED Talk is that start with the end in mind. Start with why. You know, we, we live in a selfie society, um, right? Just people consumed with themselves. And, um, and yet Matthew 20, 28 says the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. And um, that really is, um, is the foundation of, of why we do what we do is to serve others. Um, and to st- take a step back, I hope, um, you know, the message today, I, I hope you hear that I'm talking about Chick-fil-A, but of course I'm, I'm talking about everything. I'm talking about whatever you do. And so um, it's finding those opportunities to serve. Um, For us, though, particular to the restaurants is an uh, understanding that the root word of restaurant actually means place of restoration. And so there's an obvious definition to that. There's um, physical, the physical definition. So you were hungry, you came and you got physically restored. But what we talk about is what if there's a bigger definition? What if there's more to that? Um, what if we provide a space and a place where people could be emotionally restored or provide an opportunity to break bread and be relationally restored? Um, and then maybe, um, at different times, God will open the door to have a spiritual conversation and have spiritual restoration. I, um, one of the coolest examples I had was a, a dining room host that worked for me and, um, it's a pretty simple job. Um, keep the dining room clean, provide hospitality and service to, to our guests. And he said to me, you know, Lance, when I'm sanitizing tables, I've decided that I'm also going to pray for the next people that are going to sit at that table. And I loved just the missional mindset of something as, as ordinary and everyday as sanitizing a table. Um, I thought that was so cool. Um, so why does this matter? Um, let's see if we can kick off about a two and a half minute video that we have. This is actually a training video um, that, that we use.
So truly, we, we believe that every life has a story. Um, it is um, the best part of, of our opportunity and of our, of our um, business, but it's also the hardest part. Um, yesterday was one of those hard days. Um, some of you um, may know, but we have a 16-year-old team member who lost her father to COVID last week and her mother um, lost her, her mother passed away of COVID um, Sunday night. And um, that, that wasn't a fun day. That's not, that's not um, a fun thing to walk alongside a 16 year old with, um, but it is, it is an honor, right? To continue to point her to the cross and continue to love on her. Um, and so we have that opportunity, that opportunity for positive influence um, on our, our customers, which initially is what attracted me to Chick-fil-A but also a positive opportunity on, on our team. And um, God has really opened my eyes to show me that my sphere of influence and, and my opportunity personally is, is our team at Chick-fil-A and to point them to the Lord and, um, and to help them and, and, and guide them and serve them. And the overflow from that um, is that they're able to do the same thing for our team or for our customers. Um, so I, I love the phrase being a mirror of God's love. And so that's what our, our team is able to, able to do. Um, that's what we're trying to do. Um, <clears throat> looking at our, our second point of who is our example. Uh, I mean, Sunday school answer, right? But it's, it's Jesus. And so I've got a statue here in my office of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And I have this, um, it was given to me by, by our, our corporate office, by our home office in a training. And there's actually a life-size version of this. Um, um, actually, a little bigger than life-size, actually. Um, in the main entryway of our home office. And when our founder, Trick Kathy, turned 90, um, they had the, the statue commissioned and made for him. But... Um, I don't think there's too many corporate offices that have a, a, a bronze statue of Jesus washing the disciples' feet on the main entryway. But it truly is in our DNA to have servant leadership um, and to prioritize that. Um, looking, looking ahead, so that, that leaves the question for actions. Um, so what do great le leaders do? Um, what do they actually do? And this material is actually outlined in a book written by um, Ken Blanchard and Mark Miller. And here's a little, little summary. Um, the, I don't have the, the full book. I guess I've loaned it out, but it's called The Secret. This is the 10th anniversary edition. So the book's been around for a while. Um, but, and, and that material, this overview of servant leadership is literally top um, worldwide. Um, so, and um, there's over 50 international trips a year that um, it's called the Windshape Foundation, but our, our companies, um, well, it's the Kathy families, our ownership family, it's their, um, their ministry. And so they'll literally be, um, be teaching this material in, in nearly every country around the world. Um, it's pretty incredible opportunities. Um, so um, um, glad to be teaching it here in, in uh, Kansas City today. So what do great leaders do? The first thing is they see and shape the future. So that's the first blank. See and shape the future, right? This is vision. Um, we use a phrase in our company that small dreams stir no man's heart. We want to cast a bigger picture. Um, certainly young people nowadays, they want to identify with that bigger picture, um, our staff skews much long, younger. Um, the average age of our team members is 20 years old. Um, not to say we don't have a wide variety, because we do. We have all the way from 14 to 72 right now. And so um, um, we have a, a, a large variety of team members. But um, see and shape the future. Um, I think it is... Um, Oh, who's the pastor at Willow Creek? Um, I'm drawing a, drawing a blank, but he, his definition of a vision is a preferred picture of the future. Um, so uh, Bill Heibel, that's it. Um, so a preferred picture of the future is what vision is. So see and shape the future. The second point is to engage and develop others. If I said they're entitled, 
they're spoiled and they're narcissistic. Who's that describing? Well, in the online community, that's used to describe young people nowadays. And let me just challenge that this group um, of godly men. This is our work. Whether it's true or not, um, um, I, I'd argue that they get a bad rap, but there's it's kind of in vogue at what I call generation shaming to kind of shame this young younger generation because they're entitled, because they're spoiled, because they're narcissistic, because all they do is care about themselves. To me, it's like, and that is the work before us. The fields are white and the workers are few. Um, you know, train up a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. And so just a challenge this morning is um, if you think there's some skills and some values lacking in the world today, um, let's go to work. Let, join me in this. Um, find someone to mentor, find someone to pour into. Um, it does matter. Your leadership does matter. Um, so engage and develop others. The third one is to reinvent continuously. Um, we've got, um, in any organization, you have history lovers, people that love how the company was built. Um, they love what made it successful. They love um, any organization, right? Churches, churches are probably the, um, the, the top example of this, but it's the quote or the thing someone like this might say is, is um, that's the way we've always done things. Um, in our company, we say, we talk about the good old days, how things were simpler in the good old days. Um, our business, um, it may just be fast food, but it's unbelievably complex nowadays. The complexity is just, just incredible. So we'll have um, at lunch today, probably 40 people working at a time. And so just imagine the complexity of running 40 breaks and getting 40 lunches in. Like, um, it's just, just quite a bit. Um, so um, great leaders um, reinvent continuously. Um, the next blank is what do great leaders do is they value results and relationships. Um, typically, God created us one way or another. Um, and as you know yourself, um, you get to know your strengths and how God naturally wired you. Um, if you take it to the extreme, the person that's all results is win at all cost, right? This is kind of easy to understand um, from an athletic point of view is who's that person that is going to win at all cost. And then the other extreme, you have someone that's all relationships. They have really fun parties, but they never get anything done. <laughs> Right. And so it's important for every team to have a good balance of both and for leaders to value, to, to value both, um, not just to value results, but to also value relationships. And lastly, great leaders embody the values. Um, not just do you talk the talk, but do you walk the walk? Um, or there's, there's an organization out there, maybe you've heard of it, it's character that counts, right? And it's true, it does. Do you embody the values? Um, when there's an issue of character, an issue of integrity, do you look the other way? Um, or do you find an opportunity to, to serve? Um, we have historically built our business. We've got about 2,500 restaurants in suburbia. Um, that's not 100% true, but by and large, most of our restaurants are in suburbia. And so in the last five years, we entered into New York City um, and it, it was hard, it's hard. It's its own kind of, it's essentially an international expansion. I mean, it's its own world. Um, and one of the things is, um, one of the challenges that we didn't, don't have in suburbia is trash pickup. And so one of our first restaurants was going into New York City and, you know, they don't want trash outside because it'd just be on the curb every day and trash trucks can't get to these, you know, high traffic areas. So they have to come overnight. 
Um, so one new thing is that there's now a trash refrigerator in those restaurants. So they go put it in the refrigerator so it doesn't stink. And then at in the middle of the night, someone's got to take all that trash and bring it out to the curb um, for it to be unloaded. And we saw, I saw from one of those grand openings, a real blurry photo. It was not a professional photo. It was super blurry, but it was of Dan Cathy, our CEO, at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. in a ball cap moving trash out to the curb. Um, and I just was amazed at that. Um, he didn't do it for a photo op. He's, he's certainly not that type of leader, but he walked the walk of servant leadership. His actions reflected his heart in that. And so if you look at the acrostic, um, great leaders see and shape the future, engage and develop others, reinvent continuously, value results in relationships, and embody the values, what do great leaders do? And that's an acrostic for serve. Good job, Stephen. Um, great leaders serve. So as we're talking about servant leadership, it's those five elements. Um, Specifically, one thing I like to continue and talk on is an article by John Piper. Um, he's, of course, his website's Desiring God. But he wrote an article that was how to drink orange juice to the glory of God. And it's, it, it comes from Colossians 3.23. And whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. And so that's really the foundation of our Waffle Fry ministry um, in whatever you do, whatever career it is, do it as if serving the Lord. And so in our business, we talk about this, scooping waffle fries to the glory of God. And the idea is that you take an everyday, an ordinary, a mundane task, and it becomes honoring to God. And that, I think, is, is the call of man. He makes all things new. Um, I have talked about this article um, a number of times. It's pretty common. But um, a couple of days ago, as I was preparing for this, I, I went and refreshed on it and, and got a new, I, I remember Colossians 3.23, and that's always the scripture I quoted, but there was a new one that talked about, or, or, or in the, the article actually has a new view on it, that it's, um, it's on the doctrine of total depravity. And it actually says, if you're not doing this to the glory of God, that you're sinning. <laughs> like, whoa. So it, and the idea is 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I ask is sin. Uh, it, so that's the scripture. I ask is sin. Is it a sin to disobey this biblical commandment? Yes. So I draw this somber conclusion. It is a sin to eat or drink or do anything not for the glory of God. In other words, sin is not just a list of harmful things, killing, stealing, etc. Sin is leaving God out of account in the ordinary affairs of your life. Sin is anything you do that you don't do for the glory of God. My goodness, that took it to the next level for me. I mean, I, I used to talk about this article as kind of tongue in cheek, like how fun about right scooping waffle fries to the glory of God. No, and whatever we do, do it for the glory of God. And so it's really that, um, that idea that we connect with the bigger purpose, um, at least at Chick-fil-A. Um, and where that translates is instead of customer service, we now call it second mile service. And the idea is from Matthew 5, 41, that um, in that time, um, or, or well, the scripture is um, whenever a man asks you to go one mile, go with them two miles, right? So Matthew 5, 41 is the scripture. And in the Roman era, it was a law that if a Roman soldier showed up to your house, you had to clothe them, feed them, house them, and walk a mile with them. And so this was pretty inconvenient. Um, it, was not, um, it was not something people enjoyed. So, right, they were challenging Jesus on it, hoping that he'd give them an, uh, a way out. 
And he said, no, you don't, you don't get out. You get to go the extra mile, go two miles with them. Um, and so that's the foundation um, of our customer service is going above and beyond, um, going that extra step. Um, we challenge our team to act on their warm hearted impulses. If your heart is saying, man, someone should open the door for that elderly lady that's walking in. Go do it. <laughs> Just go do it. Um, Francis Chan um, in his book, in one of his books, he talks about defaulting to yes. So we tell our team, just default to yes, default to action. Don't say, let me pray about it. And if God sends me a sign, then I'll do it. Just default to yes and say, God, if I'm not supposed to this, make it clear and tell me no. Um, so to act on warm hearted impulses. Um, specifically, we go our, out of our way with elderly, with disabled, and with parents with young kids. Um, we've learned that they appreciate that, um, that extra step. Um, and so um, it was Benjamin Franklin that made a, made a quote famous. It said, the handshake of the host affects the taste of the roast. And I guess that's been studied. Um, even scientifically, that something happens chemically in our bodies when we're comfortable and feel um, welcomed, that food actually tastes better. And so in that, when we go above and beyond a guest expectations, there's three parts of that. There's three key elements. And that's that we want it to be genuine, proactive, and personal. Um, certainly robotic hospitality is not um, is not great hospitality. Um, and so that's what we struggle with. Our signature is when a guest says, thank you, we say my pleasure. Um, but at times some of our, our, our more tenured employees that don't necessarily mean the my pleasure like we really, really want them to mean it. Um, we, we want them to believe it. Um, so um, we want it to be genuine and then we wanna be proactive. We wanna anticipate people's needs. Um, there's an interesting follow-up question on that. Um, talk about anticipating needs. Are you anticipating opportunities to go the second mile? Are you building that margin into your day, into your schedule? And then personal, um, you know, it's some of the basics that we're teaching um, these young people is eye contact, share a smile, speak enthusiastically. Um, some of those basics of, of interaction, but um, um, I'm probably not the only one that I appreciate the opportunity to connect over technology, but there's just something about being shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow together, right? There's a reason the Last Supper was breaking bread together. And so, man, we are so ready to invite our community back to the table um, and be together. There's just something special about that. And then the last part that I'll touch on um, with second mile service is, um, um, is the difference between a $300 hotel and a $600 hotel. So in the hospitality industry, um, we've benchmarked with some great, great hotels. Um, we had a great year in 2020. And so last week, um, got a trip to a real fancy hotel in Florida um, that Chick-fil-A paid for. Um, it was, um, we actually stayed at the Ritz Carlton at Amelia Island. And the reason our company invests is that when you experience hospitality, you understand how it makes you feel to be treated with honor, dignity, and respect. And so the reason they kind of go over the top with some of these trips is right the trickle down effect to our, our team. And so they say the difference between a is not the facility. It's we, we studied and benchmarked across that industry. The only tangible difference is the language that the team uses. So one of their phrases with Ritz Carlton that we've done um, a case study with is they identify their team as ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. That my 
passion to serve you does not make me a servant, but I'm a lady and gentleman serving a lady and gentleman. Um, so the language. So we talk about a language of hospitality. And instead of you're welcome, it becomes my pleasure. Instead of want a refill, it becomes may I refresh your beverage. Instead of can I take out your trash, it becomes may I clear your table. Um, this is quite a bit different than the cable industry, which has given us a, a, a poor example. Um, <laughs> the cable industry I've heard, and I don't know if anyone works in the cable industry to verify this, but I've, I've been told that they refer to um, customers as RGUs, that they need to increase RGUs, which means, which, which stands for revenue generating unit. How inhumane is it to call your customers a revenue generating unit? <laughs> so all that to say, um, right, customers um, become guests um, and our language matters. And certainly it's one of those details that makes a big difference. Um, and then lastly, of course, um, is the Sabbath uh, closed on Sunday. We're pretty famous for that. Um, that'll never change for us for sure. Um, but biblically, um, you work six days. Um, not five, six, and then on the seventh day you rest. Um, I saw this week, um, of course, there's the national labor shortage, which is putting a lot of pressure on a lot of industries, but a Bojangles that put a temporary sign and said, burnout is real. We're going to give our team Monday off. What a novel idea to give your team a day off. I, I think that could really, really stick. Um, and so certainly in these times, it's been such a blessing to have that, that Sabbath and have that Sunday off. Um, so I had my, my greatest um, day as an operator two weeks ago. Um, we kicked it off with a team picnic, and that started at one. Um, we did a shelter out at Longview. But what started at noon, um, we have a director that has a little church. Um, and so the church, um, you know, 10, 15 people. And so the church had service at the picnic shelter before. And, um, and um, so at the end of that service, um, in the back of a pickup truck, we had a horse trough full of water. And we had four team members that got baptized before our company picnic. And so that was the coolest thing for me um, to be there um, for those team members. Um, because we set a goal in our business plans. We set a goal for 2021. And the goal was to have one team member salvation, one team member to give their life to the Lord this year. And um, we've had two decisions for Christ and two recommitments to the Lord, which resulted in four baptisms. And that was just the coolest thing for me, better than any net profit percentage, better than any sales increase, better than, than anything else was seeing them make that decision um, for the Lord. So um, it's been a pleasure to be with you all. Um, super thankful for this group. Um, and uh, and now I'd be happy to, to talk through any, any of the discussion questions or, or pose those. So. Hey Lance, before we get there, can you close in prayer and then we'll transition to exactly doing that dialogue with you and go through some questions and, and give you a chance as uh, listeners to ask uh, Lance, a question or two related maybe to Chick-fil-A. So Lance, pray, and then we'll do that, okay? That's great. Please bow your heads. God, we come to you this morning um, just thankful for another day. Thankful for um, the oxygen to breathe. Thankful for um, just a wonderful place to live. Um, certainly, we should never take it for granted, but we certainly don't take our freedom for granted um, when looking at the world and what's happened in Afghanistan. And Lord, we're just so thankful um, to live in this country where we have the freedom to meet and don't have fear. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to serve, um, knowing that great leaders serve, great leaders go above and beyond. And we thank you for your, the example of Jesus as he went above and beyond um, for so many. As he was so countercultural, um, he was swimming upstream that people knew something was different. Lord, may our lives be countercultural. Will our lives swim upstream so that people think, something's different. May we be the salt that preserves our community, that keeps it from spoiling, that makes it taste better. 
Lord, may, may we be the light in the darkness, the light that can shine a bright spot. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to, to serve you, and we thank you for the opportunity to love others. In your name, amen. Amen.